So as you know that uh, intravenous tenecteplase has been replacing intravenous alteplase, um, you know, at least in the uh, United States, and more and more centers are adopting intravenous tenecteplase as a replacement for intravenous alteplase. And while you know one could argue that perhaps the superiority of tenecteplase has never been demonstrated to alteplase, it is the ease of use. So tenecteplase is a single bolus, while alteplase is a bolus followed by a 60-minute infusion. So obviously the, the the ease of implementation or ease of administration of intravenous tenecteplase makes it a more attractive option of intravenous alteplase. And the clinical trials, large clinical trials have shown comparative effectiveness of both agents. So at least intravenous tenecteplase is equivalent, if not superior to intravenous alteplase. But there's always been a gap in when you take a intervention from clinical trials and apply it to general practice, because the patients that get treated are of different characteristics uh, the rigor of patient selection is obviously not there in general practice. And um, you know, it's been multiple trials have sh or multiple studies have shown that patients who are actually being treated in general practice or routine practice have more comorbidities and actually more severe strokes as compared to those who are recruited in clinical trials. So when you take an intervention based on the results from clinical trials and you apply it to somewhat a different patient population, obviously there's a need to look at it more carefully. So we actually looked at this large data set um, on patients with acute ischemic stroke and looked at which patients were treated with intravenous tenecteplase and which were treated with intravenous alteplase. And one, we found that a small proportion of patients were treated with intravenous tenecteplase. So um, you know, uh, the the application was still at a limited scale, at least when the data was uh, kind of, of uh, the data was analyzed. Interestingly, there is a difference in in which patient intravenous tenecteplase is being used. Uh, it appears that intravenous tenecteplase is actually being used more frequently in patients in whom mechanical thrombectomy is being contemplated. Also, it is more likely to be used in patients who have more severe neurological deficits. And that is actually an interesting finding. So anytime we will do comparative evaluation in routine practice, we have to be aware that intravenous tenecteplase, uh, so there is somewhat of a preferential use of intravenous tenecteplase, perhaps because uh, my physician may believe that intravenous tenecteplase is a stronger medication, better suited for those with more severe strokes, a better suited for those who actually may require endovascular or mechanical thrombectomy. Um, so I think that just needs to be uh, known before we actually you know, look at results in general practice. Interestingly, we also found that perhaps there was a suggestion that intravenous tenecteplase was also associated with higher risk of intracerebral hemorrhage as compared to intravenous alteplase. Now, what is not completely clear is that is it because intravenous tenecteplase is just a more stronger medication, a more efficacious thrombolytic. So on one hand, yes, it will be more effective in opening occluded blood vessels, but on the other hand, it actually has a higher chance of causing intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, the other thing is it may just be the patient population because it was not the same group of patients that were getting intravenous tenecteplase as those getting intravenous alteplase. So it's not completely clear that why you are seeing a higher rate of intracerebral hemorrhage because of the properties of the thrombolytic itself, or is it the patient population that the thrombolytic is being used, as in, or the patient population that actually intravenous tenecteplase is being used? Obviously, the intracerebral hemorrhages, we were not able to classify whether they actually had clinical consequences for the patient or may have been totally asymptomatic. So we don't know. Uh, whether that actually, you know, how many of those were actually symptomatic, caused neurological deterioration, how many of them were just asymptomatic intracerebral hemorrhages. So that's actually what we found. And I think it just, uh, as we move forward, perhaps this analysis needs to be repeated when a larger group of patients may be receiving intravenous tenecteplase. So you may have a, a better comparison and perhaps less subject to type 2 errors. And also perhaps the use of intravenous tenecteplase may expand into group of patients that are more similar to those that are being treated with intravenous alteplase.